His background includes teaching and coaching in urban Memphis and pastoral ministry at an international English-speaking congregation in Tanzania. An ordained Angl Anglican minister, Dr. Hood has, been pub has published a number, number of works, including Imitating God in Christ, which the ministry fellows have said is excellent, as well as many journal articles in academic as well as popular outlets. We're so gr grateful that he could join us tonight. So with that, I welcome up Dr. Jason Hood. Awesome. Uh, it's really great to be here. And uh, my thanks to, uh, I, guess, I don't know, who, John, are you in charge of, of uh, invitations? Okay, thank you so much for that. That's really great. Um, I have a spare microphone. Anybody want to do a duet with me? I'll do that. Uh, you all have already blessed me tonight. I don't know what we're going to accomplish from here on out, but uh, anybody here precocious and full of wonderment and under 18? Anybody in that category? Uh, good. Okay, so I feel, uh, feel a little better. Because uh, it was about 18 years ago, I was in a, in a setting just like this, on a stage just like this, playing bass and guitar with a worship band just like this. And um, it was uh, just always a nice refresher to come back to a setting like this because it reminds me of how God just had his hand on my life and took care of me and... and um, I, I hope you know that he'll do the same for you, you know, as you walk through the next decades, 15 years, hasn't been that long, uh, 15 years of your life, he'll be uh, taking care of you and um, uh, keeping an eye on you and, and putting you in the path that he wants you to go. Um, can we open with prayer? Can we do that? Let's just uh, bow our heads before we begin. Father, everyone here um, needs to know the answer to the question, who am I? We need to know what you've made us to be, um, what purpose you've made us for. And my prayer tonight is that um, as we look at your word, you would speak to us great truths about our identity, about your purpose for us, uh, that we could rest in that uh, and not in something that we have to accomplish ourselves or build ourselves up to be. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So turn to Psalm 8 if you have a Bible. Um, or punch it up on your phone, however you roll. <coughs> Psalm 8, and I'm not sure what, uh, what translation I'm supposed to use. I grabbed an ESV on the way out the door. Uh, this is what... Psalm 8 says, O Yahweh, our King, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the son of man that you care for him. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the work of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, sheep, oxen, also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Okay, so if you want to know about something, you go to the founding document, right? Probably this campus ministry has a founding document. If you want to know about our country and you're perplexed about the things that are going on politically in, in our country right now, you, maybe you're inspired to go back to the Constitution. Why, why did we start this country? What is it all about? And if you want uh, something of a, uh, a Constitution, for humanity, the Bible has an answer for that and has a place that you're supposed to go. And this is a psalm written by David. He's meditating on, you know, goodness knows what in his life, like his, his kingship or his task in front of him, like what he's supposed to be doing. Why did you make me? You ever have those moments on a Wednesday before an exam, <laughs> right? 
on a Friday after a date. Do, do people date here? Do they, does that happen? I don't know. This is something when I was in school, we went out, you know, anyway, uh, ask John about that. He can explain dating to you if that's not a thing here. I don't know. Um, but you, you know, you're perplexed, you know, and you, you're, you're wondering, you know, what's going on? Why am I here? Uh, is there a purpose to all of this? You know, those sorts of questions. And so David probably struggled with that just like all of us do. And what did he do? He's a good Jew. What does he do? He goes back to the foundational document, back to the Constitution, and he goes back to Genesis 1. Because this poem here in Psalm 8 is a remix of Genesis 1, 26 through 28. It's basically David riffing on um, a life-giving meme found in Genesis that tells him who he is. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to go chew on that for a little while. And then he comes up with Psalm 8. I love the fact that the Bible repeats itself like this because this is what you're supposed to do with it. You're supposed to chew on it and adapt it and apply it to your situation. That's exactly what David was doing here. So Genesis 126 through 28, I'm not going to read it, but I do have it at the beginning of your outline here because this is, with, along with Psalm 8, um, the, the foundation documents for what a human being is in Scripture. You are royalty. I realize at Harvard, maybe some of you actually are royalty. So I, just to be, I uh, have to be a little bit more specific with that. So let's, let's look at it. Uh, here we have uh, a couple things highlighted for you. Um, you know, they didn't have highlighters or underlining. So in Hebrew, if they wanted to emphasize something, they had to do what my mother did when I was younger. And she would just say it over and over and over again. Okay, so just you can look on here and what is, you know, what does God want to highlight in Genesis 1? Let's make man in our image. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing. You get the point? Repetition for emphasis, because Moses didn't have a highlighter, right? And then he comes back and does it again in verse 28, there at the bottom. Have dominion over, over, over. That's what you were made to be. That's what you were made to do. You were made to have dominion. You were made to rule over the world. All right. So in a, in a group this size, I'm sure there's some Bernie supporters who are really nervous about the idea of like having dominion over the world, right? Because that leads to rapacious abuse of the environment, right? It, it leads to um, you know taking advantage of other people financially or what have you. I mean, all kinds of problems that are produced by this. Um, one of the great principles in the Bible is that just because something has been done wrong often doesn't mean that it's always wrong to do it. Uh, and the, in fact, there may be a right way to do it. And so the Bible, I think, invites us to consider what that right way of, of stewardship, ownership, and rule might look like. All right, so more on that later. Here's who you are. You are the kings and queens of creation. All right? Um, Ancient Near Eastern context. Um, here in Boston, you can find some of the inscriptions of this sort in museums and, and things along this line. But here are some of my favorites from the context. Because Moses, it turns out, is doing something very different from what everybody else does in his world when they ask the question, what is a human being? They all have stock answers in their world. Um, human beings, whatever human being is, it's just a lot lower than whatever the king or queen is. Right? You're like way down the totem pole somewhere. So here we go. A letter to King Esarhaddon of Assyria in the 7th century, uh, a little bit after Moses, and 100 years, 200 years after David is writing this. Um, a man is the shadow of the gods. A slave is the shadow of a man. And the king is the mirror of the gods. Right? So who, who gets to be the image of God? The king. Right? Whoever's on top. Maybe a priest, you know, if you really like your priests, they're doing a really good job of that worship, uh, you know, really good sacrifices. Maybe they can be an image of God, but certainly not your average human. They're just kind of a shadow of the king. They're kind of, you know, further down. And certainly not slaves. You see the hierarchy that's going on there? You have this um, in Egypt as well. This is basically just common currency uh, in the ancient world. And so here's the question. How does Genesis and its remix in Psalm 8, how does that change the way that everyone else was looking at humanity? 
take it back to Moses for a minute. What was Moses doing when he wrote Genesis? Like, what's the point of writing Genesis? It's to help people who are getting out of slavery get into a new life in the promised land. Everybody with that? Right? So uh, you have people with a slave mentality and a slave mindset um, probably not feeling very excited about freedom, sure, but they're, they're not necessarily convinced that they have it in them to do whatever it is God has them doing on the way to the promised land. So you can imagine that they probably need a little bit of encouragement, right? And so Moses writes this and he says, every one of you people, male and female, well, notice we didn't hear that with S.R. Haddon. We didn't hear that women were made in the image of God or are the, the mirror of God. Um, yeah, the Bible's kind of nice that way. Very good that way. Um, and, and so this is a radically different vision. It really democratizes this. And it, and, it, and it really shakes things up. Psalm 8, verse 2. If you're still there, go back to 8, verse 2. You know, if you're looking for an image of God, it's got to be something strong, right? Right? Something powerful. And here's what David says. Most powerful person in Israel. Here's what he says. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. I, I think that's a difficult verse to translate and a difficult verse to interpret, but here's the gist of it. God uses weak and insignificant people for his purposes. And his kingdom is populated by people who aren't particularly powerful, people who don't particularly change the world, um, people, people who don't necessarily have everything in life go their way. And I hope that's good news. That's who he's interested in using. Um, and so according to the Bible, the, the dignity and the worth, even, even to some extent, somehow the power that is normally ascribed to kings is given to every person. That's a pretty powerful thing. I was, uh, I was a school teacher in the hood in Memphis and a coach for four years. And this is one of the most amazing truths that I got to share with my students. Um, I had students who had seen uh, parents shot to death and you know, all kinds of other horror stories that you can imagine. And so one of the questions that everybody has, but especially I think kids in that environment have this question, you know, am I worth anything? Or am I only worth what I'm capable of producing? You probably have that same question here, I think, for a lot of people in this environment, because you know, there's a question, right? Am I, am I really worth anything? If, am, I, am I really going to cut it at Harvard? Am I really going to cut it in a career? Can, am, I, if, am I really going to make a difference in the world? Or am I really going to make a pile of money? Then I'll know that I'm somebody, right? And that gnaws at people, even successful people, that gnaws away at them. Am I really significant? And so to have the privilege to be able to say to people who are really left behind by most of society, you really do matter, is, is, was a really awesome thing for me as a teacher. And we did something really corny, and I'm going to ask you to do it too. Um, I just taught my students to do this, right? We, we memorized Psalm 8, and I said, crown yourself, right? And so they would, it was a little meme that we did, just kind of a little thing that we did around school. Crown yourself. And they were just... You know, kind of with their hands. They were in middle school and they, they did that, right? I don't know, I could never get them to do anything, but they were willing to do that. And I think it's because of the power that they found, like in these verses, telling them who they were. Well, crown yourself. You go ahead and do that, right? Okay, and maybe, you know, if you're, if you're the eccentric type, just go ahead, like the dorm room mirror, just, just write a little crown, like, you know, scalp high, right? Just in, in magic marker. And you kind of see yourself just on the way out the door in the morning, you know who you are. That's good news. It's really good news. Um, I've got a handout for you. One of the reasons is that I've got some quotes that really mean a lot to me. I'm, I'm passing along here. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory says this, it is hardly possible to think too often or too deeply about the future glory of our neighbors. And that's not just because, um, not just because they're at Harvard, but because they're human. He says, it's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses, to remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you may talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or a whore and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, you and I are helping one another to one or the other of these destinations. 
It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities with awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, and all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never met a mere mortal. Um, and then he goes on to kind of describe the eschatological significance of that. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a minute. But one of Lewis's big influences, early church theologian Irenaeus died about 200. Um, the glory of God is a living human being. That's the kind of quote that just gives you chills, or at least it gives me chills. You could just be cold because it's cold in here. I don't know, but um, I, I like that a great deal. Um, and along with um, this royal identity, God gives us a royal mission. He gives us a royal mission. And, and here's what that mission is, just in a nutshell. It's expanding the kingdom of God. Expanding the kingdom of God. Um, it took me a long time, you know, working on Psalm 8, like over the years, it took me a long time to recognize this, but um, there's a sandwich here. Uh, if you're really hungry, you may just need to tune out for a minute because I'm going to talk about the sandwich. But at the very beginning, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in, in all the earth. And then um, it closes with that same line. But then in between, it talks about you a whole bunch. Right? So what's the connection? What's the connection between God being awesome and you? Well, apparently, you know, look, uh, if, if God had called up my consulting company, Hood LLC, you know, consulting, and said, hey, here's my plan. I'm going to make people, and I'm going to spread them all over the world. That's what's supposed to happen in Genesis 1, right? Y'all are supposed to fill the earth, right, and, and, and rule over it. I would have said, look, look, we've done a feasibility study, Yahweh, and these people are not up to it, okay? They're sinful, or at least they have the potential to be really sinful. So, you know, marginal upside, really, really, really bad downside. You know, why don't you use German shepherds or dolphins or African gray parrots or something like that, right? Am I right? Wouldn't that have been a better way to go? And just a lot less capacity for disaster. You know, um, Yahweh did not call me uh, before uh, he went with that plan. All right, but that's the, that's the game plan, is, is spreading the earth and making Yahweh famous by reflecting his image in his world. So your, your mission is to make Yahweh great again. <laughs> right? That's, that's your mission, right? Uh, it's a good campaign slogan. Somebody ought to steal that. Okay, you can redeem anything is what I'm trying to say. Um, all right. So the way, the way in which this frames... Psalm 8 tells you that your stewardship, your work in the world for, for good and your wise use of the world that God has given you is going to help make God famous. The way in which you relate to one another, the way in which you relate to uh, banking and finance, the way in which you relate to the field of education or law, the way in which you repair vehicles or play music, all of those things are going to contribute to God's majesty and to God being famous. All right, and one of the ways we do this is that if, if you're supposed to be God's image, then you have to look like God. You have to look like God. Uh, in the ancient world or in the contemporary world, if, if you want to extend your influence and your fame, what do you do? You get a brand, right? You get a Twitter avatar or a company or whatever, and then you multiply that as much as you possibly can. Right? You name all of your buildings after yourself and your children after yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, that's how it works, right? Isn't it? Uh, and the same, the same thing happened in the, in the ancient world. You made images of yourself and you duplicated them. If you were Pharaoh, if you were Caesar, and everybody, all the rulers and famous people in between, you made statues of yourself or you imprinted coins with your image on it. Right? And you disperse those all over the world to remind people that you were ruling, that you were awesome. Yes? Yeah? This is what you do. And so um, I, I had a word italicized in Genesis 1, salem, salem, this Hebrew word for image. Whenever this word appears in the Hebrew Bible, it's usually associated with images like graven images, statues, idols, all kinds of stuff like that. And... Um, this is what God is doing. 
He's spreading his kingdom around the world, not with coins, not with statues, not with inscriptions, but with you. Right? All right, have you ever thought about this? The Old Testament borrows a lot or shares a lot with, with other ancient cultures, right? Temples, sacrifices, altars, priests, all, all things like that. I mean, it's different in, in many respects, but nonetheless, they have those things, right? So why on earth wouldn't they also have idols, images? Why wouldn't they have tselemim all over the place? Because God said not to. And why would God say not to when he, he gave them priests and gave them altars and a temple and all those things? Why? Because he already made you. Only a living, breathing, loving human being can properly image the God of Israel. A statue cannot do it. A statue is lifeless. It cannot see you and it cannot hear you and it cannot feel for you. And so a statue just isn't going to work. And so God makes human beings. Really beautiful story, I think. All right. So that's why God prohibits images. Because he has his own images that he wants to fill the world with. And so if, he, if, if, we're, if we're supposed to fill the world on his behalf and, and look like him, what does that look like? Just a couple, a couple things. We reflect God's goodness and God's beauty. Right? God's character. You sang about that tonight. You sang about how, how beautiful Christ is. And the beauty of, of God's character and how much, as Christians, we long for that union and embrace with him. But it also means that you are supposed to share that. That you are supposed to have elements of that beauty uh, in yourself and reflect that to the world. His, his creativity, right? Um, if God is creative, he made you to be creative at, and, and at some level. Some of us more so than others, to be fair. Uh, and how about this one, power and rule. I know this is weird. I know we live in a world that is not very fond of power. People are really suspicious of power. Um, people are really suspicious of rule and, you know, anarchy is kind of coming up again. Um, but, but God really does believe that, like, hey, there's a way for you to rule the world. There's a way for you to rule your finances and to, to, to rule your life in, in, a, in a righteous way. And if God rules and exercises power, in, in righteous ways, then you can do the same. You can learn to do the same. Psalm 111 and 112 are, are two psalms back to back. I'm not going to turn there. I'll just tell you what it says. Um, in Psalm 111, uh, God is being praised for being awesome. And then in Psalm 112, the righteous man, the righteous person is being praised for being awesome. And what's fascinating to me is the way in which those two overlap. Because it talks about how God, you know, pours out lovingly for his creation and for his people. And then it says his righteousness endures forever. And then in the very next psalm, talking about, talking about humans, the righteous person, it says that the righteous man extends himself and he gives and he pours himself out for the poor. And his righteousness endures forever. So here's a vision for, for your character. That it would be like God's character. That it would be a reflection. You would be an image of, of God in that way. And there's no occupation, there's no sphere of life where you can't start to do that. Even if you've got a really bad boss, even if you're working for Pharaoh or Caesar or Nebuchadnezzar, you can begin to do these things. That's what we see in the Bible when we see people like Joseph and Daniel, uh, Esther, living in exile, uh, serving really wicked people, or at least you know, mostly wicked people, still serving God, still representing God, still being the image of God, even in exile. Bruce Waltke, uh, who took one of his doctorates from Harvard, says this, a human being is theomorphic, made like God so that God can communicate himself to people. He gave people ears to show that he hears the cry of the afflicted and eyes to show that he sees the plight of the pitiful. All right. Uh, so beautiful, right? Uh, a beautiful identity, a beautiful mission, and now here's the, here's the bad news, all right? We also have a royal catastrophe on our hands because just any amount of self-awareness at all tells you that you, have, you screw this up. Is that okay? Can I say that? Is that yeah. fair? Yeah. Um, or do we need to call your roommates or your parents? Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, what do we do with this? Because this is a really heavy burden. It's such a, it's such a beautiful vision, you know? And uh, have you ever heard this? You know, that the, the, the weight of the sin is, is not really like, you know, how bad the thing is that you've done, but who you've done it against. And you could find a small sin if you could find a small God to sin against. Right? And think about this. The beauty, the beauty of this vision, right, makes your little failures, your little grumbling and complaining and your lack of charity and mercy, in the little ways that we all do this, right, it makes it that much more dramatic and that much more sinful and rebellious. And someone, we're called to such a beautiful mission, being the images of God. And when we don't do that, it's, it's catastrophic. All right, so one of my favorite uh, figures from church history, Blaise Pascal, known at Harvard for being a mathematician, uh, brilliant mathematician, um, uh, known to Christians as uh, a great Augustinian thinker. He was in the Jansenist movement of the, the Catholic Church. Um, and, and known to romantics everywhere uh, for his pensees, the, his, his thoughts, you know, the, the heart has its reasons, which reason knows not, which is not about love, actually. It's more about philosophy and, and theology, but it applies to that. And here's what Pascal says. He says, we debase, um, yep, we debase ourselves below or, uh, no, th these are my words. It sounded familiar. It sounded good. We debase ourselves below or elevate ourselves above God's original design. Here's, here's Pascal. All right. Uh, <laughs> man, man's greatness and wretchedness are so evident that the true religion must necessarily teach us that there is in man some great principle of greatness and some great principle of wretchedness. The more enlightened we are, the more greatness and vileness we discover in man. The more the lights come on, the more impressed you should be with humanity, the more you learn, and the more horrified you should be. What sort of freak is man? How novel, how monstrous, how chaotic, how paradoxical, how prodigious. Judge of all things, feeble earthworm, repository of truth, sink of doubt and error, glory and refuse of the universe. Should we make t-shirts with that on it? Um, anyway, uh, just something to put on Twitter and, and think about. But here's the way he puts it. Who will unravel this tangle? Who, who, will, who will solve this puzzle of who we are? And, and, and Pascal's um, affirmation is this. You better find a religion or a philosophy that helps you understand how awesome and, and awful people are, that explains those two facts about humans. And so if we're asking the question, what is a human being, we have to wrestle with, uh, with this truth as well. All right. Um, so here's, there are all kinds of ways in which we, we debase and devalue ourselves. I'll, I'll just talk about this just a little bit. So um, one of my, one of my the, the things that, that really make me angry, there's not a lot of things that make me angry. I'm a pretty laid back person. Um, uh, I, uh, I told you I was a school teacher and the city school motto in, in the school where I was, uh, in the, the school system where I was, was this. Every child, college bound, every day. So we splattered this all over school. We splattered this on billboards all over the city. And you tell me what that did. There were probably a handful of people who were really encouraged by that and, and they really decided, you know what? My parents didn't go to college. I'm gonna go to college, right? Every child college bound every day. But there were thousands of other students, tens of thousands of other students in our school system who weren't, were not going to college. And what do you think that taught them? It taught them what America has been teaching people for a long time now, that if you don't go to college, if you don't get the white collar, if you don't get the degree, you're trash. Is that right? That's the message that sort of radiates out in our culture for people who are you know, in their teens. I have an uncle. Uh, didn't put his full name on here, um, uh, and, and he's one of the best humans I've ever met. He, he really is. He's an incredibly sweet guy. He lives in a state that people make fun of for good reason. I would not want to live there myself. Uh, and he is, he is your average blue-collar person. But he loves Jesus, 
and he does a phenomenal job at what he does, and he's made a difference in the lives of people at his factory, and he's, he's really transformed the place, like just, just radiance, you know, just being a good human. And in his spare time, he uses his, you know, mechanical knowledge to fix air conditioners for widows all over town, like old ladies who don't have anybody, you know, that kind of thing. He's a far better human being than I am. And what really makes me angry is that my uncle thinks that I'm better than he is because I went to college. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. All right, so that's American propaganda, right? That's, we, we debase and devalue other people based on what we think is important, right? And what we've been taught is important. And we treat other people, or at least think of other people along those same lines. There are lots of other ways that this happens to us. We, we value ourselves or think of ourselves as just an economic unit, or we think of other people that same way. Like, um, you know, I've got a quote on here from, the, from, from Fight Club, uh, which I'm not going to read, and then the movie, movie goer. Um, but uh, I'll read the movie goer part. Let's look at that. It's a, a terrific work of fiction. Um, he describes the despair that comes when our significance is, is really derived from our economic significance. Here's what he says. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to carry out the duties of a citizen and to, to receive in return a receipt or a ni neat styrene card with one's name on it, certifying, so to speak, one's right to exist. What satisfaction I take in appearing the first day to get my auto tag and brake sticker. I subscribe to Consumer Reports, and as a consequence, I own a first-class television set, an all-but-silent air conditioner, and a very long-lasting deodorant. My armpits never stink. Elsewhere, in another work, he says, we all know perfectly well that the man who lives out his life as a mere consumer, a sexual partner who avoids boredom and anxiety by consuming tons of newsprint, sub internet, miles of movie film, sub, internet, years of TV, you get the idea, that such a man has somehow betrayed his destiny as a human being. And do you feel this? Do you feel the emptiness when you sort of start to think of yourself just as a consumer and you spend your life sort of revolving around this, this right? Okay, so I'm old enough now. I don't have any dreams and hopes anymore. Okay, I don't, I don't. You have, it's strictly for my kids, you know? And, and, uh, and so my dreams and hopes revolve around like how I can make myself comfortable. It's, I mean, you can laugh because it's like sad, right? <laughs> it is. I, I don't want to be that person. I want to be someone who lives fully, lives creatively, who enjoys, enjoys comforts that God provides and that this culture provides, but I don't want to revolve around that. I want to live for something more. I want to have a, a higher identity than that, than just being an economic unit. All right, so we can debase, we can devalue, but you know what else we can do? We can exalt ourselves, right? And this is something that Americans are really good at as well. Um, what's, the, what's the most famous salem? What's the most famous image in our country? What would, what would sum up America? What would, you know, it's on the cover of our history books and civic books, civics books and, right, the Statue of Liberty, right? I mean, I mean there's probably other things we could have used, but all right. No. Uh, all right, that one's pretty good though. We'll go with that one. Uh, what, what is that? What is the Statue of Liberty? Who is that? Anybody know? Say no at Yale. Sorry, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, they don't, I have no idea. Um, it's, it's Libertas. It's the Roman goddess Libertas. Now look, you and I don't worship that statue. But do you think we worship Libertas? Do you think that the god of liberty, of freedom, of self-determination, do you, do you think that that might be something that has sort of co-opted us as individuals or as a culture, captured our heart, captured our imagination. Maybe we're serving that instead of serving Yahweh. And we're committed to that kingdom, the kingdom of self, rather than Yahweh's kingdom. Um, 
no restraints, no limits on your money or your sex, no limits on, on your freedom. That's America, right, in a nutshell? Um, uh, Ross Douthat uh, reviewed the Oprah-approved bestseller turned movie Eat, Pray, Love. I never saw that, kind of missed out on that, that film. Uh, as it kind of fell into the emotionally generous category of movies that I don't, uh, I don't typically get to. Um, but here's what he said. Uh, I thought the review was, was pretty interesting. He said, this is the rare Hollywood production where the theological message is as important as the plot. Eat, Pray, Love is a contemporary pilgrim's progress in which a scattered, baffled modern woman finds happiness by figuring out what God wants from her and acting accordingly. So she, in other words, she finds a Lord, and in doing so, she finds a Savior. The heroine dumps her husband for selfish reasons, hooks up with a boy toy, dumps him, travels, meditates, you know, dabbles in whatever religion kind of fits her, uh, practices self-forgiveness, she forgives herself, doesn't necessarily try to repair things with other people, and then she finds another guy. If everything God wants sounds suspiciously like what a willful, capricious, self-indulgent Western woman with too much time and money on her hands might want, well, then you've, you've unlocked the theological message of the movie. And to be honest, it's the theological message of American culture right now. God dwells with me as me. And the reason this resonates with people is because we want to do what we want. We want to be our own God. And we don't really want to have another God. And so every one of us struggles with that rebellion to some degree or another. Every one of us has experienced the, the fall and, and is living this out, devaluing ourselves, devaluing other people, debasing other people, or, or exalting ourselves uh, or some other would-be savior in our life. So what do we need? We need a royal restoration. And this is, where, this is where the story starts to come back together again. I could spend six weeks on this. Uh, I, I really love the way that, that this just fits together and that the Christian story just starts to make sense of all these things. Um, so just a little snapshot um, and a little invitation to restoration. This is not about trying harder. Because when, when you go out and you just try harder to do better and be better, you oftentimes wind up elevating yourself more or debasing other people who aren't trying or not caring as much or, or what have you. I mean, there, there's all kinds of ways to screw this up. This is first and foremost about seeing Jesus and seeing your need for him and getting a vision of the true image of God. And you can go to him, you know, fresh from your own disappointment, your irritability, your failure, ingratitude, slothful sins, sexual sins. You have an opportunity to repent and to be remade and to be continually renewed in this image. Um, the, end, the end of the story is a lot like the beginning. There's a destination for you and for me where ruling over the world and looking like God is not just our duty, it's our destiny. Is that a beautiful thing for you? Like, it's a beautiful thing to me. All right. Augustine put it this way. He said, Christ is the master of the mint, and he came along to stamp the coins afresh. That's tweetable. I kept it below 140 characters for you. I don't know about Athanasius here. The good God has given them a share in his own image, that is, in our Lord Jesus Christ, and he has made even themselves after the same image and likeness. This is, this is the vision, not that God would just save you, but that he would remake you into the image of Jesus, his true image. And, and so as you meditate on him, as you give yourself to him, as you surrender to him, as you look at him and study him and then worship him, you become like him. And you see this happening, I hope, and, and I pray with, um, with your, your brothers and sisters around you, even in this, in, in this ministry. Let me just uh, read from Ephesians. You can turn with me, Ephesians 4. Let's see what happens with this, this image stuff towards the end of the New Testament. I'm just going to read this, and then I'm going to close in prayer. And if you all have any questions criticisms or complaints, you can throw those my way if we have time. Is that, is that allowed? We do that?
Uh, we can mingle. Okay, okay. All right, I can't wait. All right, all right. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. All right. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must not walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And so a lot of this language is about the deadness of idols, right? And, and becoming like those things that you worship where you're callous and insensitive and just you're not alive and, and, and clean and, um, and full of understanding and enlightened. Here's what Paul says, verse 20. That is not the way you learn the Messiah assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self or your old, basically your old man, your old humanity, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self or the new man created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. Do you see? There's that Genesis vision. And Paul is saying, God is not done with that. God did not say, you guys screwed it up. I'm out of here. We're going to come up with another game plan. He still wants you to fill the world with his image. He still wants you to rule over his world, whatever sphere of it you happen to wind up being in charge of. And he wants you to do that so that God would be famous. Let's pray. Um, Father, um, it's really good for us to meditate on who we are, um, but only if we do that in light of who you are. Help us to believe that what you say about us is true, no matter how wonderful it is, no matter how critical it is of us, of our way of life or our desires. And for those of us who have problems believing in this, in this beautiful design, we just ask that you would give us grace you would show us, uh, for those of us who have problems seeing our sin, give us grace to see ourselves as rebellious. And for those of us who, who have trouble seeing ourselves as glorious children, images of God, please help us to see that as well, that we would be encouraged to reflect you. And above all, Lord, we pray that these things would happen in our lives and in this community so that you would be famous. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. We give another round of applause to Dr. Hood for that really well organized and thought out <clears throat> idea of what it means to be human and what our mission is. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we will have the part of the evening where someone from our community comes and shares a snapshot of where they are in their faith right now. So we call this a testimony. Um, we might share how we came to know God, what we believe about God, um, or what he's doing in our lives right now. And so tonight, Mwabe is going to share with us the testimony. <laughs> I feel like I can just say anything, and you guys are like, yeah. Um, so in my culture, I'm just joking. Um, uh, one second. Uh, hi guys. So I only have like I don't have much time. So I'll just try and talk a little bit. I'm not sure about what, but we'll just talk. So thanks. That's my blocking group stroke Bible course. Yeah. <laughs> They really, they really needed that affirmation tonight. Anyway, um, so yeah, I don't know what to say. I was asked to share my testimony, and um, I was telling the worship team today how before today I didn't even know I had a testimony, so I've had to go back and think of snippets of my story. Like, does this count as a testimony? I'm not sure. So um, 
I'm just going to talk. Chances are I'll end up talking about what I hope to be my testimony at the very end and not not necessarily like like test like a, something that has happened like so massive that will change your life you know it's not it's not that it's not it's serious but it's not that serious um, and so one thing I just ask and like <gasps> one thing I ask is that even as I as I speak um, and as I quote scripture or as I just share anything that I think about that you know that God has done or God is doing in my life one thing that I hope um, remains true in in this entire context and I hope you guys do is that you be like the Berean Christians in Acts 17, 17 where if anything I say like go back and check and see if it's true um, because they examined the scriptures every time Paul spoke they would go back and check so go back and check um, that's the first thing um, so a little bit about myself my name is Eunice um, Moabe is my family name during commencement, please call me Eunice because Moabe is everyone. And I think <laughs> we'll all just kind of turn. Um, uh, so I grew, up, I grew up in a Christian home. My mom is a preacher. She has a church. And she's also um, an evangelist. So she travels a lot um, around Kenya and places sometimes in Uganda, <laughs> in Tanzania as well. Um, and when I was a kid, I, I grew up just going with her everywhere. So we would go. She would. Um, what would she be doing? Yeah, she'd be preaching, and sometimes she'd be preaching to maybe people who can't read, right? So she would show movies of like, the passion, or just, just, just stuff. And then people would watch them, and then she would now explain with the help of an interpreter that, well, this person died for you. And you'd just see the Holy Spirit just like taking over, because these are people who hear for, about it for the first time and just accept Christ. Um, and I think that was, I was so used to it being around me that I didn't really, like, I, I felt like a, a legacy Christian of sorts. Like, you know, it was passed down. My grandparents were, mission, were in mission schools. So, um, so I just felt that, OK, yeah, we all are. That's how it is. Um, and then I went to high school. High school was just weird, as is the case for everyone, I think. I hope. No, I don't hope. But I think. Um, <laughs> For me, it was just weird. Like it was like high school was just one of those things. I still look back. I was like, oh, anyway, Lord. Um, and then it was my last year of high school, and um, I still was. I, I mean, I used to try and go for CU because I was a school Christian Union as well. And I would go. I'd sit for a while. I'd leave. Sometimes I just wouldn't go. Um, and my mom would constantly be, you know, sending me Bibles, praying for me, and all that. And I was just like, yeah, okay, fine. Um, and I remember it was Form 4, which is the final year. And I had, <laughs> I had a chemistry exam. If anyone has done like IB, A-levels, there's something called mocks. So yeah, I had mocks. And it was chemistry. And I was like, I really liked chemistry, but I knew. You know when you just know? Like an exam is coming, and it's like a train, and you just know it's just not going to happen. So, <laughs> so that night, I went. I tried to study. It wasn't working. I was just like, gosh, OK, fine. So I said, OK, I'm going to pray for this exam. Just going to go down on my knees and just be like, God, like this exam, you like help me pass, what, 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 you know, the usual. So then I start praying, and then I just find myself like just having this desire to just want God Himself. It was, it's so weird. I still don't know how to explain it, but it was just like I was praying, and I was just like, God, like. I want to stay in your presence. I just want to, I want you and I want to be able to accept you. And it was something I had been thinking of. So I'm not saying it was an instant change, but that was the first time like I was praying about, you know, about that. And I think that was the night that I received Christ. And it was like maybe a year, a week before my 17th birthday. Yeah. Then I woke up, I went to do the exam, I failed. Um, <laughs> and like, which was fine, because we had no exams, which was fine. Um, and, and, but the thing is, at that point when I was getting my results and I had it done well, like that wasn't the point. The point was the decision I'd made that night was probably the best decision I had ever made in my life. Um, and so the, after, I got, after I received Christ that night, I think I, I, I feel like for me that's when life started. Like that's... That's where, like, those are the things I remember. But, like, anything that happened before is so blurry, 
and I don't know why. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah, I went to school, but I mean, I know what happened, but I don't know what. I don't remember my thoughts, which I'm not saying everyone should be have forgotten everything. It's just my experience, great guys. Um, but like, I think I think the process from then till now has been so. It's been fun because <laughs> God has a sense of humor sometimes. But like, it's also been. It's been fun, but then it's also been very um, challenging because there's been a lot of things about myself that I've had to let go of and had to die to. Um, and so today's testimony, oh, that was a testimony, but then today's testimony is just me sharing with you guys what I'm hoping this journey looks like and what, and I hope, and what my sight of this journey, how I hope that, um, informs your sight of your journey. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? OK. So, so, um, so yeah. So the way I look at life is this. Um, at the end of the day, uh, give us maybe 60, 70 years, we'll all be dead. Like, but it's true. No, it's true. No, it's true. We, like, death, it's death. You'll all, not all, maybe some of you might be lucky, you know, 90, 97. Yeah. But for the most part, <laughs> but for the most part, life, like, that's life. Like, we are, um, at least in this world, we are mortal, right? So we will die, which means there's a finite period of time. That's the first thing. Second, when, for those of you who have accepted Christ or, um, is, you know, like when the altar call, if that's what your churches did, um, or said that, that prayer of deciding, or, or rather just decided to follow Christ, you didn't decide to follow Christ and then vanish because you're still here, as you can see, as I can see you. You didn't disappear. I still see, you know, hi, Kriana. Like nobody disappeared once they, once they say that prayer, unless, unless there's, you know, I'm just seeing people who are not here. Um, and so that, that helped, like, just the fact that life is finite, right, here, um, and that the fact that you didn't disappear means that heaven is at the end, but then there's something that needs to be done between them, right? So it's like um, we are getting there, but then there has to be, there's a reason why when you wake up in the morning, you wake up in the morning. It's not like you didn't, dis again, you didn't disappear. Um, and so then the pursuit of, so then because it's, it's, a, it's a period of time and you're getting somewhere, it's a journey. And there's a, you have to have this, I have to, or rather I, desire to have this constant reminder of this journey mentality that I'm becoming something, I'm going somewhere. So that everything is deliberate and everything is, choices I make are not just things I'm making just because I look cool when I do it. I, I was telling people during pre-retreat that following Christ isn't cute. It's not about, it's not about being cute. Like, yeah. So, um, and so then between now and the finish, if between now and the time you die or the time that Jesus comes back, if that happens before you die, the idea is that there's a, there's a, there, there, it's a journey and there's a place where you're going or there's a person that you're becoming. And the question is, what does that journey, what does that process look like for each of you? For me, and I hope becomes the case for you guys that, my pursuit is to, as he said, become like Christ. And then now that changes how I look at how I read my Bible. Because now reading the Bible is like, what does the Bible tell me about Christ and how does that become who I am? Whether, and it's not like by, um, it's not by working at it by our own will, but by letting his Holy Spirit work in you. But you have to be willing to let the Holy Spirit work in the first place, right? Um, and becoming like Christ def is, defines your lifestyle, right? So like the way I treat people needs to reflect that. The way I treat people today needs to be even more Christ-like than it was yesterday. Um, and that might, mean, that, that might mean pain. It might mean letting go of things you want to do. It might mean not having time to do some things that you think would be fun or would be, you know, like, oh yeah, I just, I, just, I just like doing this, but maybe there's something else he's calling you at that particular moment. Um, and so my prayer for you guys, and I, my prayer is that by just constantly thinking of life as a journey and as a process, that you give yourself time to be aware, okay, 
I'm going somewhere, which means it's not instant. It's going to be, you know, it's going to continue over time. It's going to be sometimes painful. Um, there's a verse in, I think, Hebrews 12, where he talks about um, him disciplining those he loves. It's not it's not always going to be rosy. There are things that you, you know, but that's how he prunes you and he grows you into the person that you, he wants you to become until the place where all of us as the body of Christ attain the measure of the fullness of Christ. Um, and so, yeah, may your prayer, may our prayer be that we may decrease to the point of invisibility that he may increase. So when we're living life and we're being the light of the world, it's not just our light, it's his light that we are becoming witnesses of, the way John the Baptist said it. So let's, let that be our prayer. Let, let his will be the reason why we live. So yeah, I feel like that was a testimony. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>